Hi, welcome to Study Nation. Hi, Ben. It was just a, a pleasure to be here. With a string of awards and accolades, including the Prime Minister's Award for Children's Literature, Wendy R. has written over 40 books for children, teenagers, and adults, and been published in 29 languages. She has appeared on some of the biggest conference stages and wrote the first Australian children's book to be adapted for a Hollywood feature film, Nims Island, starring Jodie Foster, who was passionate about the book because it had turned her son into a reader. The sequel was also made into an Australian movie starring Bindi Arwen. Wendy's latest book is Cuckoo's Slide, a companion to the highly acclaimed Bronze Age novels Dragonfly Song and Swallow's Dance. Wendy believes that every child deserves to find the books that fuel their passion for stories, encourage empathy and connection, and empower them for the future. Thank you so much for joining in today. Are you ready for the interview? I am. Okay. <laughs> You wrote a story called Spring Island at the age of nine. When and how did you turn this passion for writing into a serious profession? Not until I was about 32. But first, I, I actually am going to show you the two notebooks that had Spring Island in them, which my mother always saved. My mother saved a whole big drawer of my writings. So... Yes, so I actually wrote lots and lots of things ever since the time that I learned to read and write in English, which is when I was seven, because I learned to read and write in French first, uh, but we spoke English at home. And um, it, when I actually read a story in English for the first time, it was so exciting to me that I think that's when I decided to be a writer. Wow. But I, when I was in high school, I just suddenly thought, well, but how would you do this? And, of course, when I was in high school, we um, we did not have benefit of YouTube channels or of seeing authors um, on things like this. And I went to a country high school, and um, it, it, was, it was a good school, but we did not have sort of visiting authors come and talk or anything. So I just thought, this is too weird. I have to do something else. And so I just kind of put all that aside. And I, I became an occupational therapist. And But it was still there. It was just always, whenever I was between jobs, when I had my two children, and I had about a year off each time, and I'd be thinking, oh, I think I really need to start writing. But it wasn't until I was crossing the road with another occupational therapist going out for lunch one day, and she said, did I tell you I've written a book? And now I would like to say that as a good and supportive friend, I said something like, that's fantastic. Tell me all about it. And I hope I did. But what was going on in my mind was, when am I going to do that? I've always said I'm going to do it. And so I was actually doing a course at the time and I sent it off on Christmas Eve. And on New Year's Day, I just started writing. And that was, uh, I was really serious about it. I was still, I was working. I had, um, well, I guess one preschooler and one child in, in uh, grade one. And I just took this very seriously in all my spare time and just wrote and wrote and wrote. That's a very fascinating journey. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. A catastrophic car accident turned you from a working class person into a full-time writer. What was this transition like? It was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. Um, by that stage, I had written... I think I had I had three books published and I actually had quite a lot in the works. And but I used to think I would actually never want to be a full time writer. I think my ideal would have been to work three school length days a week. And then I could have like dropped my kids at school because it was a long bus ride. And 
you know, like being home a bit more and but actually had all that time for writing. In fact, maybe I even thought two days a week would be ideal, but I thought it would be really lonely. We had a farm. So, you know, living on a farm and being a writer, uh, I thought, no, I, I would like to go on having some social contact in like the real world. And uh, so when I had this car accident, it actually took me 15 months. I strung up my sick leave for 15 months before I had to admit I was not going to get back to work. But I found it very difficult to say that I was a writer even though I had three books published. And it wasn't until, I guess it was two years after my accident, um, that one book was shortlisted for the Children's Book of the Year in Australia. And I started to feel I could say I'm a writer. And in fact, that morning, I, um, I had to clean out my office and I couldn't drive, but a friend drove me up there and I said, right, I'm booking a psychologist appointment to talk about how terrible I feel about cleaning out my office. And when I got to the psychologist appointment, you got to remember this is before mobile phones or cell phones. Um, the receptionist greeted me and she said, your husband's been trying to, to call here to tell you something about a short list. And it was, the most sort of classical example you could have of one door closing and another one opens. And so then I, I started to feel I could say, I'm a writer. Wow, you're a strong woman. Well, you don't have much choice in life. <laughs> At the end of high school, you thought of studying journalism, but couldn't imagine being a reporter and instead started animal care in Kingston, Ontario. In addition to this, most of your, most of your books have an animal character in them. Does this have any connection or no? Um, it probably does. It's probably the reason that, I, you know, my love of animals is probably the reason that I actually realized I could not do this animal care course, which was basically uh, qualified you to sort of cut up lab animals. And um, I realized I was really not suited for that. And uh, yeah, animals have just always been a part of my life. And I, I love watching wilder animals and I love the comfort of having a dog at home and until I broke my neck, I, I really loved horses. I mean, I still love horses, but I don't ride them. Um, and yeah, animals are just important to me. I think that they add a dimension to our lives. And often I throw really tough stuff at my characters and I feel they need an animal friend. So I think that's why they're always in there. That's cool. Your book, Peeling the Onion, was honor book for the Children's Book Council of Australia Book of the Year, Older Readers, in 1997, and an American Library Association book for older readers, as well as listing on their best of the best list, best 100 books in the last 50 years. Would you like to share with us the events in your life that sparked the idea for your award-winning book, Peeling the Onion? Well, yes, and that that was actually the car accident that changed my life. And that that's the cover. After my car accident, so I was 37 when I when I broke my neck. As you can see, I'm not a paraplegic. I've recovered remarkably well and much better than I was told I would. Uh, my life is limited in, in a lot of things, but I have been lucky. However, it did change changed my life dramatically. I felt that as a writer, I wanted to write about it. It was it, it was an event. It was a plot. Uh, probably That's what I told myself. I suspect it was something I needed to explore. And I didn't want to write about myself. I also knew it was going to be a really tough book to write. And I thought, well, I... I'm now known as a children's writer uh, because this was after the first shortlisting. I think 
uh, yeah, I had several more books. I, I'm not sure about any more awards. I can't remember. But um, I knew that it would it was going to be safer to stay in that genre for such a tough book. But it was mostly wanting to do it at a distance. Probably what I didn't realize is how much of myself was in it. I always said, oh, no, it's not autobiographical at all. I just use my accident, my injuries and my emotions. Um, so in other words, it was highly autobiographical, um, except if you like the sort of more external part of the plot, because the girl is 17, not 37, and therefore she's in grade 11. Um and, yeah, she's not a wife, mother, occupational therapist and writer. I made her karate champion. I actually struggled with that quite a bit because my my son was doing karate. And I got a bit superstitious about it, but I, I talked it over with him. And I wanted something that just showed her as really strong and because we do need sort of shorthands in fiction. You, you need to, you know, you can't have her being this gentle girl who, um, you know, loves to write or something, but is actually really strong as well. You know, we, we want to give her this personality. And so I made it about a karate champion who breaks her neck. One difference I made, my one bit of kindness to her is that she was not the driver. Um, because I felt that as a 17-year-old, that was just sort of like one step too far, and it also just kind of muddied the waters. Um, also, in Australia, she wouldn't actually have her full license, so it, it kind of complicated it more. Uh, so, but what I wanted to explore was how we go on when the world changes people talk about miracles and i'm not a great believer in miracles i think sometimes they happen but to me the miracle of life is that when disasters happen and i, I mean i remember one well-meaning friend coming to me in the hospital saying well you know if it were me i'd sort of rather be dead um, because of the risk of my actually being a quadriplegic. And I thought, no, I do not want to be dead. And so people often think that before something happens. But the miracle is that people go on, that people do build a new life. And it may not be the life they wanted, and it may not actually be as happy. But it can be happy and it, we we do go on and and i think as an occupational therapist that was so much of my core belief as a therapist that i worked mostly with children and yeah um sometimes this was not the child that the parents had expected and prayed for but they loved this child and everybody was going to make the best and go on to make their own miracle of continuing to to have a full life, even if there were problems that they hadn't thought of or certainly hoped for. So I think that was the sort of philosophy around it. I love how you see the positive in everything and never give up. Well... Thank you. I I think, well, you just have to. Yeah. You have been honored with the Prime Minister's Award for Children's Literature. Tell us a little bit about it, like when and how you won that award and what significance does that award hold? Well, it's an interesting one. In Australia, the Children's Book of the Year Award is usually seen as the main award. Um. And, and I did win that once with um, Ark in the Park. But the Prime Minister's Award, which is more recent, is obviously very important. And what I noticed is that, like, my neighbours, who mightn't be very interested in children's literature, 
they were really impressed that I'd won this one. You know, they had a party for me and um, it was wonderful. And it was for this book, Dragonfly Song. And this book, look, in some ways took me 30 years. And I sometimes think that although I explored a lot of things in Peeling the Onion, that in some ways there was emotion that I hadn't explored until I wrote this. Now, I didn't know that till I had been working on it for a couple of years. Um, I kept starting to write this book and deciding it was going to be too odd because I could only see it in verse. Uh, well, I tend to like hear my books before I start. Um, but it's set in Minoan Crete, you know, in the Bronze Age, 4,000 years ago. It's very complex. So how do you do that in verse? And then I, I just woke up one morning and I rang my editor, who we were quite good friends. And so she knew about this story sort of starting a long time earlier. And I said, what if I tell it half in verse and half in prose? She said, why not? It turns out I wasn't, I'm not the only person to have done that, but neither of us had actually read anything at that stage like that. But she just said, try it. But I mean, even while I was working on it, I thought there's a very good chance they will publish this book. This book is going to be too weird. And I think the first honor it won was uh, a Librarian's Choice Award for high schools. And that was such a relief. It was like, okay, you know, I've spent so many years and so much kind of angst and sweat on this book. Um, it's going to be okay. But for it to win the Prime Minister's, which is massive financially too, I had to share it with a very lovely picture book writer. But, you know, the children's book world is not a wealthy world. And so actually winning so i i won forty thousand dollars um which in american dollars is about 25 but it's a lot for here it's a lot of money it's way more than i normally get paid for a book and so that was fantastic and it was really really scary because actually most of the awards they send you a letter a week or so before and say you know embargo do not tell anybody but you have won the award you know do not tell your mother um and this one, they don't tell you. And it's awful, the terror sitting there. And uh, I was handing around rescue remedy um, candies to <laughs> all, the other, all the other people who are also sitting there thinking, you know, like, do I win this award or not? You know, and, and if you don't share, it's $80,000, which is you know, a lot. And it was very, very tense. And in fact, because they said there were two people, I sort of settled back down in my chair and thought, right, I, you know, I haven't won because there's no illustrator to share it with me. And then they called me up and actually I can see on the videos of it, I am deathly white. It... <laughs> <laughs> but I will tell you a really lovely story about it because this is called Dragonfly Song. And the reason it's called that is because right through the story, anytime I made a big decision, anytime I saw how I was going to write it, I saw a dragonfly within some 24 hours. The day that, and, and then eventually I realized that it had to go into the title, it had to go more into the story. The day that I sent it off to my publisher, like the sort of finalish draft. And I went out, it was summer. I sent it off. I went outside. I lay down on the lawn in the backyard and I looked up and there was a cloud of dragonflies above me. I have never seen such a cloud of dragonflies. And it was an amazing moment. So wow. I did actually share that when I. I think I actually have no idea what I said in that acceptance speech, but I believe I shared that. <laughs> I believe you deserve that award. Oh, well, thank you. It was, it, it's, it's just, 
you pour so much into a book and it's very, very difficult to uh, to always be full-hearted in your praise of your fellow authors when they win things, when you had really wanted your book to win. And the, unless it's, uh, you know, like a really funny book or something, certainly anything literary. I mean, this is children's literary fiction. If it doesn't win a big award, it'll be remaindered in a year and just thrown out. And, you know, you've you've put years of your life into it. And so the awards are a real confirmation. Obviously, money is, is really nice stuff to have. But um, that confirmation that what you've done has worked, that's that's what is really lovely about it. You're absolutely correct. Your first Australian children's book, Nims Island, was adapted for a Hollywood feature film starring Jodie Foster, Abigail Breslin, and Gerard Butler. Tell us the whole process of how Nims Island was picked up, optioned, and made into a film. I just feel that my writing life has been full of really beautiful stories because um, Nim, just a minute. Uh, this is this was the um, U.S. first edition, and so it. Um, I mean, it sprang from the story Spring Island that I showed you. It sprang from that in some ways. Um, uh, I was writing a story about an author writing to a child and I started it in um, uh, that it was going to be all letters to each other and it was just absolutely dead it was just terrible and then I suddenly re remembered one day this being the nine-year-old who'd written this story Spring Island about a girl on an island and once I got down into being that nine-year-old then I was able to write it the way it is. And so it, it came out and it came out in the States and it um it was published in a few countries. So it, it did, you know, reasonably well. And in Los it won it was one of the Los Angeles um best the Los Angeles Times best book of the year. And so it was in the library. Paula Mazier, an independent producer, picked it up and took it home to read to her son after starting to read to it she read it to him she uh, went on reading it and two weeks later she wrote and said may I have the film rights and we became excellent friends um and I might anticipate your your next question yes. because of our friendship that that built up over the process of pitching it so as an independent producer, she was just actually asking for the rights to pitch it to a studio. I, of course, didn't understand that. I thought basically I had a movie, you know. I had no idea. It was like a one in a million chance. And so we stayed really close during the five years uh, between her initial email and the screening of the film. I worked on the uh, first draft of the screenplay with her and the scriptwriter Joe Kwong. And when we were replaced by the eventual director, film writer um, uh, combo, uh, we still stayed very close. And so I was like constantly in touch. We probably emailed or spoke on the phone every day, except one, one week holiday um, for five years. It was intense and fabulous with what I learned about storytelling and uh, yeah it's just such a different way of doing it have you watched your own film oh yes and the first time I watched it was actually at the Australian premiere and I cried so much I actually couldn't see it um and then I, I guess I saw it about eight times on a little tour in the U.S. And and then the last time 
I watched it was the last day that it screened here in our, our local town. And I had like been at a screening, but this, my husband and I just kind of snuck in quietly and watched it and watched the audience. And uh, then, then we snuck out, not very snuck out, with the huge cardboard um, freestanding poster. And you can see, um, I'm pointing at my screen, which isn't useful, but you can see the cardboard nim cut out there. Uh, the, the poster itself is too big, but the cinema said, why don't you take it? So after having going in kind of incognito, we <laughs> we went out with this mammoth poster. And I love having them in my office like that. Oh, when a reader reads a book, he indulges in his own world of fantasy, where he creates his imaginative characters. However, when one watches a movie, he has no choice but to accept the characters played by the actors. Since you were the one who created these imaginative characters, were you happy with the way your adaptation turned out to be? And do you think the actors did justice to your characters? I think what helped were the two things of having worked on the screenplay with Paula and Joe and really getting a deeper understanding of that everybody brings their own things to it. But also my very first book was a picture book and I've written a few picture books. and that is a very kind of humbling lesson because of course you have the pictures in your head as a writer but what I very quickly learned was that I was really lucky that somebody else was illustrating it because I am not I do not have such a great visual imagination as an artist as a visual artist and so my very first picture book really just brought me so much joy and sense of recognition. Oh, this is what she really looks like. And I think that that was good training for the film. So, I mean, Jack in particular, I guess um, I did not see him as good looking as, um, as Jerry Butler actually is. And I just decided we could all cope with that. And, I mean, Jodie Foster just so wonderful I think I had no concept at all that we could you know, maybe have actually a, a really huge star um and I mean she's she's funny and and of course it was beautiful when I realized that she when she told me about her son uh becoming a reader and, and actually reading the story to his younger brother and so that that made a lovely connection but also Abby Breslin, who was just, I, I know she's an adult now because the film was actually made in 2007, um, and she was 11 then. But she was such a lovely girl, and she was so excited about doing all the things that she got to do on the Cannes promotional reel. She said, I, I get to swim with a sea lion. <laughs> You know, that's the bit that I would really have liked to do is to swim with the sea lion. And so I think seeing their enthusiasm um, was a huge part of it. But the very first time I went on set, um, it, was, or sorry, it was actually on location and went out into the rainforest and Abigail Nim was running through the rainforest with a real um, little bearded dragon um, instead of a marine iguana. Bearded dragons are much cuter. Um, a real one on her shoulder. It was just phenomenal. It was, you know, because it was just so exactly, perfectly out of the book. And so, yes, that is why I, I think that is why I just cried so much to see these people come to life and and to know that, when I told Jerry Butler that he did look so exactly like the actual hero of the stories, and he said, oh, really? And and all this gear, because he's got very complicated um, kind of leather jackets and stuff. And I said, well, no, my imagination isn't good enough to actually give you the whole gear. But, yeah, just totally. And he 
was so pleased. And it was just such a beautiful reminder that, you know, people might be famous stars, but we all really want to know that what we're doing is working. And or, I mean, it's working uh, for other people. And so, yeah, again, I, I, look, I've just had a really, really lucky career, I'd say. It must be a very beautiful feeling to see your characters come to life. It was. It was just incredible. Yeah. yeah. I'm happy Obviously. for you. Thank you. Jodie Foster is a big name in Hollywood. Did you get the chance to interact with her or the director of the movie during the whole process? Were there any online or in-person discussions of how to go about with the movie? Well, as well as working on the the um, a screenplay with Paula, after that, I was officially um, just a consultant. Actually, I was just officially a consultant the whole time. I wasn't actually supposed to be working on the script, um, but we just decided it would be good that way. And um, so I had limited input in the sense of my words didn't have to carry weight. But the the directors um, and so the the final directors and screenwriters were a, a couple, Jennifer Flack and Mark Levin. So they wrote the screenplay together and they directed together. And so they were still very open to my asking questions and saying, okay, you know, really, I, I don't really like this. And there was one thing that I, I did actually argue with them quite a bit over. Um, I have Alex Rover in a a 40-story building. And to me, that was really important because she was like on an island, her own island in the clouds. And it also kind of just really reinforced her isolation from the world. What they wanted was that if she was in San Francisco, then, and because they had placed him obviously on an island that existed, <laughs> uh, whereas mine was made up between the Galapagos and Hawaii, um, they had her on a tropical island north of Australia. And so they liked the thing of the two characters looking at each other across the same body of water, across the Pacific. And that is something that's actually very moving to me. It's something that I have often thought about with my parents um, and family on the, the west coast of Canada. And so that's an important thing. When I went on set and I walked through the house that was Alex Rover's San Francisco house, it was the creepiest feeling it really felt like it was a house I had lived in and had just forgotten about. And it was so Alex Rover's house. So, yeah, I was, was lucky there. Everybody concerned was so friendly. Jodie Foster came up and introduced herself to me and she said, you're Wendy, you wrote the book. I'm Jodie. I said, yeah, I guess. <laughs> um, she was really lovely and and she I actually had a little extra scene where I go through security ahead of Jodie Foster and so there were the producers two kids and um the illustrator my husband was first and so he got cut out um and it's just a quick flash and I'm just putting my bag on the security carousel belt. And, but of course, all the extras had had these very strict instructions about you do not speak to Jodie Foster because, you know, there were 250 extras being this airport scene. And, and you can imagine the chaos if everybody was sort of rushing out, oh, can I have an autograph? So, Jody came in after we'd run through this security thing about 15 times. And she said, oh, you're doing it today. Isn't it boring? So still, it was just incredible. 
because it was like, why is Jodie Foster talking to that nondescript woman? <laughs> and somebody came up to me later and said, are you family? <laughs> so, no, they were all lovely. Jerry Butler actually hosted a screening of 300, which had just come out in uh, DVD at the time. And so he just hired the local cinema uh, theater and hosted a screening of that. And then um, we went out for dinner together and it was um, he and my husband actually got along really, really well. And um, everybody was just really lovely. It, um, it was an amazing experience in that way. It was it was so different from a lot of what you hear and what you expect. Um, I maybe I was just lucky, and really, maybe most people are nicer than than people expect. <laughs> it must be an incredible experience. It was fun. <laughs> now, tell us a bit about the translation of Nim at Sea into the film Return to Nim's Island, starring Mindy Irwin. Oh, well, that was quite a different journey because originally Walden Media, who did um, Nims Island, was going to do it. And then there were, you know, people change in, in you know, corporate roles and they decided um, that they would just let it go ahead with a smaller Australian company. And... So now that one, I wasn't actually quite as involved with, and partly I realised that I really had to go on writing and and I couldn't just um, go on kind of waiting for Paula's emails and, and having uh, fun with all this. And But I also went up on set a couple of times and... I mean, I was so impressed with Bindi. Well, I can't call her a kid now because she is also grown up and even has a baby. But she was 14 then and just such an amazing kid and so willing to just kind of throw herself into anything and do it again when the directors wanted it done again. And just, of course, excellent with the animals. Um, I mean, it is quite phenomenal to watch her with animals at the the premiere for that, which was at the Australia Zoo. Um, uh, she was handling this mammoth snake. And I mean, it, you know, all right, it's not a venomous snake, but it's huge. It's so heavy. And I I know I kind of thought when they brought out the animals, like, oh, I don't know if I can, you know, actually do that. And I think they said, actually, you won't be strong enough. And um I got a darling little iguana. So I was very happy about that. But it was just so interesting to watch somebody who really, you know, really embodied Nim with with her um with her animals. And look, because it was an Australian film, it was much lower budget. So there were very significant changes to the um to the book story. But when I read the final draft of the screenplay, I thought that is totally like a story that I could have written. It was like if I just, because everything that you write, you know, you, you have this idea, you have this idea, you choose one of them. Sometimes afterwards you think, oh, I could have done it this way. It might even have been better. Um, and it was kind of like that. If I just thought of it this way, I could have done that instead. And they totally had Nim's spirit and the book spirit. And so, yeah, and the most gorgeous cinematography, honestly. I, I kept thinking, why doesn't um, Tourism Queensland use this as a promotional film? Some of their photography was just phenomenal. So it was a lot of fun too. That's so cool. Amanda's Dinosaur, which won an Ashton Scholastic competition for an unpublished picture book text, was a turning point of your career. Since then, there was no turning back. What was in your mind when you wrote that picture book? Did you specifically target a younger audience? Oh, yes. So there's Amanda. And so this is a, 
the text I wrote at the end of that first year of deciding I was going to be a serious writer. And now, like a lot of people, I didn't think that I could write a picture book because I can't draw. The point is, you don't usually do your illustrations. I mean, basically, if you're a gifted artist and you want to write as well, then that is fabulous. But for most of us mere mortals, we've got sort of one of the skills. So I hadn't actually thought about picture books. But my children were four and six. So I was reading picture books all the time. I had been reading picture books, you know, many a day for six years. And I actually used to use picture books at work too. So they were kind of in my psyche. And a lot of them were, of course, um, up to date, because often when people start writing for children, they're actually thinking back to their childhood and, you know, the stories that they loved, when, which are now 30 years old, or maybe, you know, their grandmother's favorite book, which kids can still enjoy, but they're not going to get published now. So I was just lucky with that. The friend who had crossed the street with me and told me about her book, we shared a subscription to a writer's magazine and they had a competition in the, I think, December issue, probably the last one we got. And it was to write the text for a picture book. And um, so I, I wrote this and... My kids used to get on the bus with a friend who had, uh, well, we all had farms, but uh, she had heaps and heaps of animals. And she even had a monkey. Um, and so I started playing with that thing of how, you know, a child wants a pet. Now, what does a child do when their mother has all the pets there are? They've got to want a dinosaur. And, of course, both my kids were fascinated by dinosaurs then. And so I and then I have a two year old and a three year old who are fascinated, grandchildren didn't have them, then, um, uh, who are fascinated by dinosaurs. And so I sort of list all the animals that Amanda's mother has, all you know, it's like all the animals on the farm, but Amanda wanted a dinosaur. And of course, you know, she hatches a dinosaur egg out. And the book went through and I got the most terrible acceptance letter in the history of acceptance letters um, where he said we decided that nobody should win the prize because, um, uh, you know, none of them was actually worthy of winning the first prize. So, I, I mean, it, it did actually win the first prize. But it was just they, they said, but yours is worthy of publication. Um, and uh, so anyway, here's a contract. <laughs> I can't believe my husband actually opened the letter because I was at work and he nearly threw it out till he got to this bottom thing. And sort of, we want to publish your book. So I had to change the ending, which wasn't quite right. And my editor then, who is still a friend now, gave me the best editing advice. She said, put it in the linen cupboard for three months and you'll find the answer. I don't think it took three months, but of course at that stage I did everything I was told. I did not use a metaphorical linen cupboard. I went off and I tucked it under the sheets and um, followed her advice exactly. And then finally saw the ending and um, wrote and, and the for a first book, it did quite well. So it was published in, in uh, the US and Canada and Australia. And it stayed in print for about 20 years. It just, just went out of print a while ago. So it, it was, uh, yeah, it, it made me think, okay, I thought I was going to write adult historical fiction, but maybe I'm going to write children's. Maybe I'm really set at that kind of level that actually I really like living in mostly in children's world. <laughs> what was the original ending like? Um, 
Oh, yeah, it was terrible. It was terrible. That's right. I don't remember what it was. Um, at, at the end, Amanda and, Amanda's dinosaur grows really big, and there's some foxes uh, chasing uh, chasing the chickens, which is always a problem when you have hens. And Amanda's mother comes back and sees everything and all the mess and Amanda's dinosaur. And I think she actually sees the dinosaur and Amanda's ma mother faints. That is a terrible ending. You do not have the mother fainting as the end of the story. I mean, really, there's your mother dying for all intents and purposes, dead on the floor. You know, not good. And so uh, now um, it's it's open about whether or not the dinosaur is real. The the mother comes back. She sees the mayhem that the dinosaur has created by chasing the foxes. And, you know, she says, what on earth happened? I don't think dinosaurs like foxes, said Amanda. What I find interesting with it being open-ended is that if I read it to, say, five-year-olds and ask, is the dinosaur real? They say, of course it is. If you read it to seven-year-olds, they think it's in her imagination. And so it's, it's and that's why open endings, I think, or, you know, slightly open ends. We do have to resolve things a bit. But it's nice to have something open where the reader brings their own thoughts to it and participates in in the reading yes that's right before we end our interview please share where we can find your books well in in the u.s um the some of them the the more recent ones of um dragonfly song and cuckoo's flight and swallow's dance may be in bookstores but they often won't be because even, I mean, Cuckoo's Flight came out during the pandemic, which was a, a rough time for books to come out. Um, they are certainly available online. Um, I mean, I mean, the hard copies are available online as well. And uh, books that you can't find that were published in Australia and have gone out of print in the US, like uh, Peeling the Onion is still in print in Australia. Um uh, but not in the U.S. anymore. It went out of print just a very few years ago, but I think it is out of print now. Uh, and Book Depository in the U.K. is always a good source of books for um, uh, that that aren't actually in print in a particular country. And um, they, it's not secondhand books. It's just that they actually source them like directly from Australia and ship from Australia. So that's often the easiest. But I do have to say, please always check your local bookstore first because we need we need our local bookstores because they know about books. And, and especially like something, as I say, like Dragonfly Song, um, a verse novel about Minoan and Crete. You know, you need somebody to, to read that and tell you about it. It's not going to be picked up in Kmart. And um, so, yeah, I just have to say something about local bookstores because they do such a good job. Are your books available on your website? Um, yeah, well, information about them. And, and there are a few that I have copies of that are out of print and that I that I can ship. It just depends on, you know, <laughs> where you live and how fat the book is, how much the postage is going to cost. But um, uh, yes, I do, I hope, have information about, about where different books can be, can be bought. And of course, I don't keep it up as currently as I should. But you and if all else fails, you can always write to me and say, I really want to find this book and I cannot find it. And sometimes I have to say, neither can I. But um, and some of those I'm trying to do something about and you know awesome with this we end our chat thank you so much for joining in it was fun talking to you it was a delight and again congratulations on on what you're doing and thank and you it was an absolute delight talking to you thank you so much